virtual format. Um, we are excited to have a couple panelists who will be sharing some of the speaking time here today and sharing um, their experiences and perspective, but want to start with a few housekeeping pointers for this town hall. We are counting on your questions and comments to create an engaging experience. Please use the Q&A feature located in your menu bar below for any questions and comments, and this is the main way we can communicate. If you see a question or comment that you like or that you were going to say, hit the upvote button, which is the thumbs up. This will move that question or comment to the top of the thread so we can respond to those first. Please also feel free to respond to other questions or comments. Please only use the chat feature if you are having technical difficulties. We will try to respond to those, but we will have a little a bit of a difficulty troubleshooting issues that if you're having them on your end. This town hall is being recorded. We will have it available next week to send to you. So the little bit of the format today is I'm going to start off telling you a little bit about um, what Sewell has been doing in response to COVID and in response to Black Lives Matter. Liz is going to share also um, from a personal experience as VP of programs a little bit more in depth about each of those issues. And then for our panel, we're going to conclude with Ian sharing about um, racism and ableism and his experience. And then we're going to leave 20 minutes at the end of this for your questions and to make this as interactive experience as possible. And we hope by having panelists that you'll, you'll fear the, feel the interaction between all of us. So to start, I'm uh, Heidi Heisenbuttle. I'm the CEO at Sewell. I wish I could see all your faces and say hi to you personally. I'm really glad you're here. And really glad to be having this opportunity to talk to you. So from there, I'll let Liz and Ian introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Liz Mendes Shannon. I'm the VP of uh, programs at Sewell. Uh, I'm a Latina Im Im immigrant who's proud and excited and be here and share. Yep, Ian. Hi, I'm unmuted. And so therefore, I can tell you that my name is Ian Watlington, and I'm coming to you live from Washington, D.C., where I work <clears throat> at the National Disability Rights Network as a, a disability advocacy specialist. Um, it's a broad umbrella term. I'll leave the details uh, for another time, but uh, I'm really looking forward to a discussion as we talk about all of this, which is heavy stuff, no matter which way you look at it, COVID or Black Lives Matter or race in general. So thank you for coming on. Great, excited to have both of you on the panel. So I'm gonna start a little bit giving you some um, updates about what we've done over the past couple of months. So when the COVID-19 outbreak first occurred and we were advised by both Denver Public Schools and our nursing partner, Children's Hospital, to close, we closed starting effective March 16th. And since then, we have tried to find meaningful ways to connect with both staff, families, and children to make remote learning as interactive and valuable experience as possible. So we started out actually with Liz leading us um, just to teach us all Zoom because those of us who are more technology ineffective had to learn Zoom pretty quickly. And we, then we just started reaching out to all the staff and making sure they, were, they felt connected and able to do the teaming that we do on a daily and weekly basis. By April then, we were able to develop remote learning experiences for all of our children. And each team worked incredibly diligently to create those experiences for their ch um, children. So circle times once, twice a week, um, team meetings with children and families, ways for children to still feel included with their classmates, but also ways that uh, families could individualize what their remote learning experiences were. Quite early on, within by the end of March, early April, we also realized that 
some of our families were struggling. Um, just as you see on the news every day, we were, it was the basic um, food, clothing, and shelter that families were experiencing difficulties with. So we had a couple of donors um, and our board really committed to what we ended up calling emergency family relief fund. And we established a committee of our family service workers, social workers and other staff. And we meet every Tuesday and we review um, the requests of the families. And a lot of it was money towards rent to keep people stabilized even with the no eviction, we didn't want people having to come out of the COVID crisis and owe thousands of dollars in rent. The staff um, rallied themselves, collected food. Um, we made our Champions for Children lunch go to the Emergency Family Relief Fund. So as of today, we've probably helped about 30 plus families and given out about $30,000 of food gift cards, rent, Etc. So we are very proud that we've been able to do that um, and really feel like that stabilized families and they've been incredibly grateful wanting to give back and give the connection. So between that and the virtual, we have, we, I, I think have actually strengthened family connections. That's what the staff feedback has been. And we're looking at what we're going to try to continue as we open up in our phase ones and phase twos. Um, of how we can keep that family connection going a little more strongly. Lastly, one of the opportunities we had during this um, remote learning period was an opportunity for 50 staff um, originally enrolled in a universal class of Reggio inspired for the Colorado early education communities. And they um, participated with Rebecca Cantor, David, Lori Ryan, and individual teams to take module one of that class. And there have been some incredible outcomes of not only their experience to team on Zoom, but to learn more about Reggio inspired classrooms and Reggio inspired virtual learning. And Liz is going to show a little bit of that with her turn so you can see some of the outcomes of that. So fast forward, we got into um, April, early May, and the governor had given the order that essential services, e.g. childcare, could start. So we um, have had a commitment to pay our staff to be able to do this remote learning and family connection, but realized families were in need of childcare. So after a couple of family surveys and a couple of staff surveys, um, at the beginning of June, we opened up three classrooms, one preschool and one toddler room at our Fillmore, uh, the Coble Building, Fillmore location, and one at our Dahlia campus. And that was really a slow entry. About a quarter of our staff are back and roughly 30 children. We kept the class sizes low per the guidelines initially. So that was phase one of reopening. We start phase two of reopening July 6th. Next week, we start training the, all of the rest of the staff who have clearance to come back from their doctor or medical provider. And we will open an additional eight classrooms, uh, two more at Dahlia, three at the zone, which we have um, permission to open, and then three more classrooms here at the COBA building. We are waiting to see from our partner, Denver Public Schools, what our services for children with special needs will look like. We don't know if that will be hybrid. We don't know at all locations. We should know more of that next week. And then we will plan our August services, our new school year, based on the collaboration with all of our um, funding providers. So we think we've learned a lot through this. <coughs> it has been challenging. It's been a strong, strong board and staff team, and, and we're very appreciative of that. So now, Liz, if you'd like to talk a little bit about Reggio and remote learning. Sure. Um, I did want to say, too, just being a part of this, this, this way that we just completely organized, we were able to mobilize ourselves and our teams and our families to not just do remote learning, but to be there to support and help in any way that we can. It was a beautiful experience just to see that 
experience with our mission and have our mission be expanded to include this, this you know, type of support. And now everybody just came together. Um, I know our tag, our tagline is we're in, we're all in this uh, together and that really, it came to life. So I was very inspired to see that. For Reggio, so I was one of the ones that began module one and, and definitely went at my own pace because of just all the, uh, the, the items on my plate and was able to move through module one. And what I've learned is more about being able to, to shift my paradigm. Um, you know, when you think about being able to support a child and their families, you're not only just, uh, the focus isn't only what you see in the classroom, it really has to expand to the many networks that child is a part of. So home, community, environment, um, culture, upbringing, ancestors. I mean, it's full blast on understanding that one child and being able to collectively bring together the strengths and the trust in that environment. So I really was um, did a lot of my takeaways from uh, the, the modules and the um, exercises and the experiential learning. Um, what I so yesterday I was a part of a presentation that was at the zone from the infant and toddler team, and it was pretty remarkable. So Matt, if you're able to share the screen up for that slide, just wanted just to uh, take away and, and capture that, that, that moment. Give me a second here and I'll have no it. No problem. Up. Oh, there we go. Is this it, Thank Liz? you, Matt, yeah. So we just wanted to highlight this one slide as part of the town hall uh, presentation and, um, and, and, and chat about how the team came together and really um, used resiliency and their relationships with families to be able to come together and think outside the box, outside the, the physical in-person box and think about how how can we expand what we do outside of the classroom. So this this picture in particular is a favor because if you see the the family's home and the children are at the table and they're looking at Lindsay through the Zoom computer there, <laughs> and it's uh, remarkable because learning becomes so much more live and you know, and, and families and children come together with their teachers and specialists and teams to really pull together and say, how do we do this? How can we learn, have fun, and be a part of this new, new changes? Thanks, Matt. Um, is there anything else that I, I, you want to share there with uh, Heidi? I would just add with the family feedback that was given to the team was that they loved how connected they were and they loved that they had options of when to when to log on, when to do these activities with their children. It gave family flexibility and it gave staff a chance for a more intimate look at families' lives, which was also meaningful. So now we have 35 follow-up staff that are I'm gonna take module two of the Reggio class starting next week. So we're very excited about those continuing learning opportunities while we're all remote. So then um, as we've been dealing with coming back from COVID, we have all been impacted as you all have um, by the murder of George Floyd and all the subsequent um, and prior um, murders and violence and tragedy affecting black lives. So we decided as both a board and staff that this is something we need to integrally address through ongoing conversations and reflect how our services need to change or adapt accordingly. So we started, um, we were looking at it in a th kind of a three-tiered area. We're looking at it, we all have to look at our personal and interpersonal um, growth um, and, and racial consciousness. And we've started some conversations both on the team level 
and on a community level, which Liz will talk a little bit more about. We have, have a curriculum that is based on teaching tolerance, on anti-bias, on teaching difference, um, both racial and ability. And so we need to hone in on what that looks like on our, on our daily interactions and in our curriculum development and our book choices and our facilitation of children interacting one another. And so we're diving deeper into that, just reviving that. I think that's something we've always done, but we need to look more deeply at that. Then we're looking as an organization as to what are the parts of the top of our organization and the bottom parts of our organization that need to integrate more of this. So for example, um, how do our recruitment practices need to change? How do our um, hiring practices, our interview questions need to change? How could our board address more diversity on the board level and board recruitment? So we are, we are um, addressing this on all levels of the organization. And lastly, we're going to look at who we are in the part of the Sewell community. We are in, as you know, in nine different locations, plus all Head Start sites. When COVID is not here, we are in many locations of the city that are very diverse and uh, more than half of our children, two thirds probably, um, are children of color and of all backgrounds. And so we wanna make sure that we're addressing these issues in all of the communities with which we work and enhancing and deepening um, our understanding of all of this. So we welcome, again, your questions, your questions and answers. We'll get more in depth based on that, but I wanna hand this over to Liz to talk a little more deeply about that and then we'll go to Ian. Um, yes, so, um, so Heidi, did you, you want me to talk about um, personal, uh, professional around teams? What we've been doing in the virtual cafes. Sure, sure. So in the virtual cafes, um, so we're, we decided to go deep and really discuss having some, some courageous uh, discussions, conversations. And we understand that a lot of our staff come from, um, have intersectional I I identities. I need to have that, that space to feel that it's okay to talk about what their experiences is like. Um, and some of the staff is also on the town hall. So I encourage you to add your comments in the Q and A as well. Um, what is, it, what is powerful is that we began with prompts. We began to open the door to this type of a discussion across all sites. Everybody was invited to this. And folks were able to share just their own, how this has impacted themselves in their personal lives. And then we were able to discuss how different it is among each other, this social location e e experience of what we feel and how we see it in our own lives. What is also has come out is that how do we, knowing what we know now, how do we integrate this knowledge and this awareness into our role, our professional role at Sewell? So the virtual cafes have been a safe environment where this comes up and it discussions come up and conflict has come up, awareness has come up with tears and conviction. So holding each other accountable to being able to, to move in, into what we hear, what we're learning, what this training, what a workshop is, and how do we, we put it into practice, into real action. And that, that's been the, the process of our, our virtual cafes. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. Ian, your turn. Add it's your my turn. All <laughs> right. Um, well, I just want to first share with you a, a story in that if you guys are feeling exhausted and like you haven't figured all this out, welcome to the club because that's part of all of this is dialogue, experimentation, um, discomfort, comfort, both. And I just want uh, you to know that even an organization as, you know, fancy named 
National Disability Rights Organization. We don't know what the heck we're doing either. I hope none of them are watching, but we're figuring it out just like Sewell's figuring it out. And, um, and here we've worked in the diversity space um, since our inception, but this is kind of a new reckoning with new energy behind it, I think, and that this is starting deeper conversations and there is kind of just an emotionality an emotional driver to this because of COVID, because of the death of George Floyd and the death of many other African Americans and um, at the hands of police, especially. And so I wanted to talk just a little bit more and piggyback on what Liz was talking about. And that's the intersection, intersectionality and um, I won't get too professorial here, but that, that is um, exactly what it says, where one identity or one aspect of your life intersects with another. So for example, I'm a white male, but I'm also a white male with a disability. And then I'm also a gay white male and I'm from middle class background. And so all of that informs my worldview. And too often in this society, and what I encourage you to think about it, as you discuss this and figure out tools you're going to implement, is that it is absolutely unfair and almost a, a tragic act for, to make people show up as one person, as just that one identity or to pick an identity. Like today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna emphasize my disability and, and then tomorrow my whiteness. Well, they all come together. And so my sense of white privilege as a disabled person is probably different than other white folks because they don't have the disability piece. So I just wanted to just talk to you about intersectionality gives you, and, and Google, Google it, Kimberly Crenshaw is the main uh, uh, speaker on this. She's a professor. And um, it just gives you a sense and a vocabulary to talk about this. Let's talk about an ism that we don't talk about very much. And then I will pass it on. And that's ableism. And that is, again, prejudice against disability. And if you think that um, we all don't have ableist ideas of, of what kind of, um, what kind of uh, ideas that people should look like and act like and, and their disabilities and the stereotypes that we put on that. That is also um, an inter, it is an integral part of your dialogue at school is how do you look at disability and even though you are inclusive, what does that mean? Inclusivity isn't just an event, it is a continual conversation and process. And I just want to show or tell you that it is unbelievable, if you look at the data, it is unbelievable how race and disability intersect on a multiple issues. Black boys who are disabled are more likely to be suspended than any other student population that exists. Black boys with disabilities are likely to be in the juvenile justice system more than any possible other uh, population. Black girls are more likely with disabilities to be disciplined also within the school environment, mainly for behaviors and things that make other folks uncomfortable, some cultural stuff. 
So what I, my final point is, when you talk about disability and ableism and how we look at that, and you talk about race, you're really talking about an intersection that affects your all's lives as uh, supporters and staff of Sewell on a daily basis. And that it's time that we not take away or we, sep we don't separate where ableism and race intersect and other isms as well and identities uh, too. But I just wanted to let you know that in this time of, of racial uprising and consciousness, it also is a great time to start talking about disability rights and disability and ableism and where that fits because the data shows that there are just incredible ties to kind of unwind and figure out what you can do as a learning community and as people individually. So I just wanted to share those little thoughts, the uh, little nuggets with you. And I just encourage you to uh, continue learning, continue discussing and really um, challenging yourself. Um, I know that my conversations with my employer are going to be somewhat uncomfortable as we go forward and we talk about race and how it intersects with disability as well. So that's just where we are, folks. And um, it, it actually is. Um, a good opportunity to really uncover some stuff that's been festering for a long time. So thank you. I'm really glad you brought up the suspension and expulsion issue. And um, as many of you know, that just went to the Colorado State Legislature last year. And Sewell has had a long history um, of suspending and expelling incredibly few children, maybe four children over 30 years um, who needed more significant uh, mental health supports than we could provide in our early childhood system and have taken a strong stand against suspension and expulsion as a pro-inclusion um, service agency. But it is, people are usually shocked to hear that it's two to three times more the preschool level than any other um, grade level People usually don't understand that. It's not challenged as much because of the range of both nonprofit and for-profit systems and that it's, they're not mandated services. So providers can quote unquote, get away with it more easily. Um, so we get lots of referrals of children who have been suspended and expelled. And we, tr we dive deep pretty quickly to get the services and supports that children need. But it is, um, of huge proportions based on race and disability, usually invisible disability, usually um, ADHD or some trauma that's occurred at no fault of anyone's, just a buildup of things. And these invisible disabilities can label these children at a very early age and give them a really hard time in the school system. So we are trying very hard um, to get children to realize the self-regulation they need to be successful moving on and mostly to get the services, the deep level of services for learning and mental health that they need. And that's part of our integrated model. But in an effort to keep this interactive, we are counting on your Q and A's um, in the Q and A section versus the chat, because we'd love to dialogue more with you, but given the webinar format, um, can't open up the floor to your voices, but are really looking for your uh, written questions so we can dialogue. I mentioned one thing that um, I know Sewell doesn't directly deal with, but um, at, the, at my work, we're really um, looking hard at um, the reform of the use of school resource offices. Mm -hmm. And I know that for many people with disabilities, uh, that is a huge issue of um, do we want to de-police our schools? Right. And do we want police to be the ones that are making us quote unquote safer? Mm -hmm. 
have any great answers, but I know it's a problem and that we've, we've intersected some, intercepted some of their uh, documents from uh, school resource officer conferences. And they're just assuming that everybody's gonna have a behavior problem coming back from the COVID situation. And they're raring to go, which actually as a disability population and as populations of color, that doesn't make us feel safer. That mm -hmm. actually makes us nervous that they are um, getting so pumped up and that's what their rhetoric is showing. So as if you needed more uh, causes to think about and care about, we have to think about where police and law enforcement are as part of this reckoning that we're having around race. And guess what? They're in schools. And so think about that as well. I just wanted to mention that. It, it has not been an issue for Sewell. We, we have not um, had any school resource officers, but it has been an issue for our charter school reach and what has been recommended in some cases. So I think there's gonna be a, there's gonna have to be a look on all levels of that and how you address behavior. And we have had Sewell graduates, um, not even in REACH, just in other schools who, um, because they've been on the spectrum and their behaviors have bis been misinterpreted for different intentions who have um, been handcuffed or arrested as young as 12 or 13 and some before that. So again, very traumatic uh, for young kids in those communities. I just wanna highlight how you know, the rhetoric that um, I keep, you know, hearing across from social media, but also in, in circles um, is if only they just, if only people would just, you know, you know, listen and do what they got to do and, I, and they won't get arrested. And that is just a false, especially in the community of color, because it, it's way past that. We've already been able to see that even even um, when we pay attention or we do what we got to do to not get arrested, it does not work. And if you can imagine the, the way that, uh, especially like even me, when I'm driving and if a, uh, if I'm, if a police car it, uh, pulls me, me over, it could just be that I skip the stop sign or something, but my anxiety level rises because of the context of, who I am and who I represent and the stereotype, the bias and the racism that I have to come, come through with, you know? And so I can't imagine a child being held at gunpoint or told and having to be cuffed. Those are things that are currently and have been existing. And this is, and this is why you know, we're making that commitment because our children are infant and toddlers and, and preschoolers, and we want to make sure that they know that they matter. So it looks like there's a question in the Q&A about what we do on the classroom level to teach and what changes we would make around race and discrimination, as well as what we recommend at home. Um, we have we have used a lot of strategies around teaching tolerance. It's actually more than tolerance. It's teaching understanding. So on the preschool level, um, and I'm hoping some of you staff that are on there can uh, type in some more ways that, because you're in the classroom and know these ways even better than I, but um, having when you're doing self-portraits, um, having different color crayons that recommend that represent all colors of the skin, talking about why somebody picked out their crayon, how it's the same or different than somebody else's, talking about how everybody is different, what's the same and what's different. Some um, have darker skin, some have freckles, some have blonde hair, some have black hair, some straight, some curly. So at that age of preschool, toddler and preschool, they're just learning about themselves. So you want to make it about them and their egocentric self, but also make it about noticing their friends and peers that are um, right next to them. 
I think the teacher's role is critical, teachers and therapists in the classroom, bringing it up, talking about it, um, not shying away from it. For a school staff, we do a really great job of that around disability. We talk about if someone's not walking or someone's using a chair or someone's in a walker and remembering that we need to be doing that about the color of our skin. Um, and we also need to be doing it about behavior. So we just talked a little bit about this yesterday in a team meeting. For those kids with invisible disabilities and their reasons they're not listening or misbehaving or having some anger outbursts, it's describing why and what's going on in their brain and it's in simple ways and it's also empowering children to stand up for themselves and advocate for themselves um, and we can there's lots of books um, lots of books about um, and, and having books in your house that represent all races um, that's one easy thing to do I mean we tend to get books that we grew up with in our childhood or that we remember or that look like us Get some books that intentionally look for books that represent children of all races, all languages, and show them in non-stereotypic um, roles, as well as include people with disabilities that you can see a child with a Down syndrome or you can see a child in a chair. So it's, it's really diving deep into literacy um, and thinking about how you're representing that. And if you would like us to send some resources out about that, we um, certainly can. I think lastly in that area, our staff have been trained in pyramid strategies, um, which is, have been addressed for helping learn about challenging behaviors, but it also gives just a great way to talk about ways people can mo model their behavior in discussions. And I think it's us as adults being able to talk about it. Yeah, his color is different than yours, or his skin looks different. and. He has a mommy who's white and a daddy who's black. Just finding the words to get children to talk about it and realize that all the similarities that are there as well. I think kids read our comfort or discomfort with talking about difficult subjects and our ability to do it authentically versus um, in more stigmatized Heidi, are you there? I think we lost Heidi. <laughs> there you go. Blame it on the bandwidth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to um, add on to what 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 Heidi is saying, that from a perspective um, of uh, a person of color uh, growing up and, and not able to um, to see yourself in in media, in movies, unless it's through a stereotype that is being, you know, played out. Um, having a curriculum, even in early preschool, being able to utilize those components as part of your identity and feel valued in that community and to see yourself in books and to be able to negotiate your identity and, and accept it and 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 love it and embrace it is exactly what curriculum should be about and so that's one way um, that impacts uh, childhood but experiences that are community-based and will stay with you as you as you live as as uh, in in the adult world um, in in addition i do want to also add how our teachers our specialists our administrators all of our staff including our board when we think about how we're trying to champion um, our self-awareness and our journey in this during this time in particular together um, it's pretty um it's authentic in that um, when teachers and teams are working with with children, you know, their process of being able to learn and their process of being able to adapt their self-awareness into the curriculum and how they see children, how they assess, how they accept, how they engage is also impacted 
by the work that we're doing through the virtual cafes and through trainings and through teaming and supervision. Um, so yeah, it all, it, it, it all comes together. Ian, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, to that. You're muted. <laughs> Here, it's amazing what happens when you unmute yourself. Um, anyway, I, I would just say that again, that as we have a police car running by my window right now, um, but anyway, I, I would say that again, it's all intertwined as you said, Liz, in a very eloquent way and so it, it's just figuring out what is the best way for you to integrate these things all together and be, be willing to take risks and be willing to kind of um, be uncomfortable. But also, I have no doubt because I love Sewell to death that Sewell would be a safe environment for uh difficult conversations and um and that um don't be afraid of of that because we're all in this incredible time of tumultuous uh environments and we're all learning a lot um so it's about being intentional and safe and and again i can't say i'll Liz and I probably could talk about forever, but the intersections of the identity and how, how it all comes together and makes sense. So I hope you're hearing some of that. Heidi, did you freeze again? I'm here. I'm okay. here. Good. <laughs> Sorry, something There's happened. So Had to get off and back on. Just listening. Okay. You're so uh, still. <laughs> Welcome back, Heidi. I wanted, there's a question from Krista. Um, this is from Open Doors Preschool in Austin. She asks, how is schools financially staying afloat during the pandemic and adhering to new CDC guidelines? So Sewell was fortunate to have the opportunity to apply for the PPP loan, Payroll Protection Program loan, and we received it on the first round. So the commitment in that, although the guidelines have changed or keep changing, is that um, you prioritize that funding for staff salaries. So we have kept everybody on um, for remote learning and family conditions, and that has been a huge um, support as we move into phase one and now come into phase two. So between that and then the fundraising that happened through our luncheon and um, thanks to some donors for the Emergency Family Relief Fund, Keeping Family Stable has um, kept us afloat. Now we're looking creatively as we get into our new fiscal year about how we can manage the CDC guidelines, which I'll discuss, as well as um, bring a lot of our staff back and how we can be creative about that. So we're trying to think creatively and keep um, incredible teamwork going. The CDC guidelines when we started in um, early June mandated classroom sizes of 10 um, and we kept that with two to three teachers. So we are trying to figure that out. We are trying to figure out what feels like the right class size as Colorado licensing has said we could go back up to 15 but yet we need to keep as much social distance of six feet apart as possible. Um, there's just not enough physical space to do that with 15. So we're trying to find a healthy balance in between of closer to 12 children. We have been incredibly committed to making sure that our programs are inclusive and so that the, we continue to bring people back both with and without special needs. We are taking extensive measures to keep and make sure staff are safe. So we take their temperature every day, they sign in, 
um, that they don't have any of the symptoms. If they have any symptoms at all of sickness, they stay home or they go home. We've been, we keep class groupings the same of staff and therapists. So um, we have a great nurse consultant from Children's Hospital who works with us and is a regular part of our committee meetings in intentional how we make these plans. So July will be our next test and then we'll see what we do um, in August when we restart, but it, it will take a toll on us financially. And so we're trying to um, figure out what that looks like. I'm kind of sick of the term, the new normal, but I don't even like the term normal. So we're trying to figure out what the new reality, I don't know what, what is new and how we're going to um, balance this and how we can keep some staff remote for that, for remote learning and not, and we're in the throes of it right now. I, I'm looking at the q and I just want to uh, value what Carrie is adding to the conversation that as educators and therapists, we also invest a lot of time and, and, and energy in, in connecting with relationships with children and families to create a safe environment um, for individuals to bring up the difficult topics like some questions around inclusion and race, et cetera. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Any other questions at this time? Would love to interact more. <laughs> Matt, uh, Tina has, I, I don't know if it's a question, I'm not able to see it on my computer here. Yeah, um, so Tina asked, I think in addition to race, gender also plays a factor in suspension, more boys than girls. So going back to our, the, the conversation around suspension. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, please keep the questions coming. We'd love to hear from you or any comments on what you've heard or any questions on uh, Seoul and uh, the upcoming year and what that could look like. Oh, here's uh, one from Tal I think Talia. Uh, is there any plan to advance technical communications with families right now, especially, especially around regular email updates? Yes, that has been an ongoing struggle for us. Um, so we are working, we have somebody getting all of the emails entered right now so that we can give you regular email updates, hopefully weekly um, or monthly coming from Sewell and then your teams can increase that as well. And trying to get all of that onto the web and the social media posts as well. We, um, we have, we are investing in technology. We've needed more for some of our staff. We realized the ones taking the Regio class who couldn't participate because they didn't have laptops at home um, or needed to rely on their phone and it's a little difficult to take a class on your phone. Um, we also recognize we have some families who have not been able to participate in the virtual learning because of not having access to technology. So looking at some grants to families to help that as well. So. That is another big piece is how we're going to update um, remote learning and technology advances. Uh, here's one from Taya. Uh, in, in regards to reopening, my daughter goes to the zone. She loves her teachers and kids and always asking to go back. Even with social distancing and other measures, how, how do your staff ensure social distancing with kids? <laughs> the plan in the classrooms, great question. So again, we are following all the CDC guidelines and our staff wear masks and our staff wear smocks to protect um, the spread of germs. And we are trying to give as much distance with play activities as possible during the day and hence the keeping at smaller groupings for a while. Um, it is really difficult to, you know, children want to be with other children. So we're just trying to do reminders. We're trying to set up the center times further apart, look at outdoor activities that are further apart, talk to the children about the guidelines. Um, you know, if a child needs a hug, they need a hug. We're we've been trained by our nurse that we have to realize what we're able to do um, at children's developmental level. 
the biggest thing is keeping the groupings the same. So there's no new exposures. So if it's the 11 children, it's always those same 11 children. It's always the same three teachers. It's always, it'll be the same therapist if therapists come in. Um, and they are all wearing um, masks and they are all building sanitization into their daily routine. So we shorten the day for phase one to eight to 4.30 so that staff would have a chance to do more cleaning in addition to our custodial staff doing the cleaning. So it's all of those things coming together and children have health checks coming in, families have health checks, Families don't go back out the same door they come in, so they're not cross-contaminating. Only one parent is allowed in the door at a time. Um, we don't reuse pen. We have just several practices that are kind of embedded at this point. Hoping that it did answer your question. Yeah, and, and please follow up if you have any more questions uh, regarding that and the situation in, in the classroom. And anyone else, please, uh, if you have questions, comments, on anything you've heard today, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, I guess we'll ask our panelists if you have any final thoughts you want to share, Liz or Ian. Um, I just want to, I guess, I, I when I say, you know, is there a word that will keep us going? Um, with me, it's hope. Really um, understanding that, that change does uh, take time. But for the first time in a long time, I feel like we have a whole community that is committed to doing this. So, so for me, it's hope. Ian? Um, well, let me stick with the word theme. I like that. Um, where I am is, um, this is, I think you said it as well, Liz, this is opportunity. There's opportunity for growth in this time and there's hope that it'll happen. <laughs> I think we've tried several different times in several different ways and a lot has changed in this world, but because of a confluence of events, more change will happen, I think slowly, but more rapidly than we're used to. And uh, so, I just want to thank Sewell for their continued commitment to not only education, but to social justice and to um, honoring this moment, um, just not as, um, quote, educational, but realizing that the world is education. And so uh, I just, I love you guys. And I really appreciate being a uh, part of this panel and um, I, I um, I can't imagine having to manage all the things that you'll manage in the coming back process. So I'll certainly be thinking of you and in any way I can be of help from a distance, I, I'd be glad to do it. I guess I would end with two words, um, tenacity and resilience. And I think that just sums up what our community has been. Um, our staff have been very resilient in learning new ways to interact and connect. We are incredibly grateful to our families for sticking in there with us as we try to figure this all out. Our donors, our supporters, our board for all of your support. Um, we're, we're gonna be resilient through this. That's what we teach to children and that's what we need to model as a community. And we couldn't do it. Um, without your support, Ian, from Washington, and without you, Liz, and the rest of the staff, Paige, James, people on this panel. And um, we hope that we can join you another time and continue to find ways to connect. And I think 
what well, as we're summing all of this up, it's remember to use your voices. Um, use your voices to advocate. We, our children need us to do that. And so collectively, we have a pretty strong voice going forward. And thank you, Heidi. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. See you another time. Bye. 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 Thanks, Heidi. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us.